were designed, we were created with capability of love. And then what happened? God commanded men, man and woman to become one and go forth and basically multiply. Fulfillment of this command not only requires eros love between a male and a female, a physical one, but an agape one, to take care of their offspring so that humanity can fill the earth. If Adam and Eve just had the eros love, just the physical love, the, just the intimate love without the agape love to take care of their baby, well, they would never have been Cain or Abel. They would have not made their infancy. The world calls this the instinct to survive, instinct to propagate. But why? When the selfless and unconditional love for the baby goes against their instinct to survive. If you think about it, for all of you who are, especially here who are a bit older, if we think, you know, people say we, we were, well, we had the instinct of survival. Where we get that is another story. But if we have that, if I had a baby, that baby wouldn't be, it would be against my instinct to survive. It would be a problem for me. It would be a burden for me. For me to be true to my instinct, I would not take care of that baby. I mean, this sounds cruel, but if you were hungry, you would eat the baby. Survival of the what? The fittest. Instinct of survival. But humans never did that. From the first man and woman, we had the agape love. The greatest commandment to love God and others, it is not a new concept in the New, new Testament. It wasn't invented by Jesus after he was born as a man. No. It was a part of creation. It was part of the original design of humanity. After creating and fellowshipping with Adam, God walked with Adam. God says in Genesis 2, 18, he says this, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Well, Adam was never alone. Who was Adam with? Adam was with God. But yet, God determined that Adam needed a relationship besides with himself. Then it says this, a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. Well, did Adam have a mother and a father? No. Adam never had a mother. Adam probably didn't even know what a mother and a father was. He was the first creation. This shows that from the very beginning, God designed humans to love him and love each other. That God created them with not only the Eros love, the Philia love, but also the Agape love was there. And in order to make humans capable and realize this love, God created Adam and Eve and all of us with this thing called a free will. This brings us to the third point of contamination of love. Well, this free will, with the free will comes the possibility that we would exercise that will to not love God to not love each other, to disobey, to reject, and to sin, and be selfish, self-centered. And this possibility became the reality with the fall of Adam and Eve. And as a result, love is becoming more and more selfish, self-centered, and these days, self-gratifying. Look around. 
marriage no longer seems to be till death do us part. From the 1970s, it seemed like parents no longer make sacrifices for their kids like they used to anymore. We seem to be living in the last days as described in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 4. Let me read this again. We read this a couple of weeks ago. But know this, hard times will come in the last days. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, ir irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Look around. See the world that we are living in. Look within. This may be some of us. People are not lovers of God. People are not lovers of what is good. Rather, they are lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure. God created us so that we can love each other, and he gave us things to use in our, in our needs and pleasure. We are to love others, love people, and use things. But look at the world. It's using people and loving things. Humanity has reversed the order because we put ourselves in control to define what we're going to love and what we're going to be using. In the name of love, people in the world seem to be hurting each other. Sin has contaminated love. And love has become ugly, hurtful, and abusive. This brings us to the last point of the necessity of love. To save his beloved creation from this contamination, God acted to restore love to its original form. Restore fellowship with him as well as fellowship among us, each other. 1 John 3, 16 says this, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. This is the first necessity of love, to know what love is. True love, as intended by the Creator, we must first know and love God personally. He loved us so much that he created us with a free will, even though he knew before even creating us, that if he created us in such a way that he would have to suffer, to be tortured, and to die to redeem us. But he loved us enough to do that. Let's say that when you befriended a friend, before you befriended your friend, you knew 100% that if you were to befriend that friend, you would have to die for him to die for her, would you be friends with that person? If you knew you had, to, there, there was no choice. If you're going to be friends with that person, you're going to die. Let's say like World War II. In Germany, there were Christians who knew what Hitler was doing was wrong. And they were hiding the Jews. And they knew that if they were discovered, that they would be killed. It wasn't an option. But they did it. How many of you would be willing to do that? Well, God loved us enough that he created us with free will, even though he knew that he would have to die for us. You know, we have to love God. I mean, that's just a fact. Because we were designed to love God. My car, to run it, I need to put in gas. 
If I don't put in gas, my car's not going to run. Car, well, unless you have an electric car, but still, whatever your car was designed to run on, you have to run on that thing, otherwise it's not going to run. We were built to run on who? We were built to run on God. God created us that way. God created us. He designed us so we are happy. We are fulfilled when we are with God, when we are with our friends. And we are having a loving relationship. Phileo loving, eros loving, agape loving. God created us that way to be relational. From the moment of sin, people have been trying to fill this void of God in their hearts with everything but God. We pursue comfort, pleasure, knowledge, feats of greatness, achievements, accomplishments, ambitions. We build societies. We go to war. We sin and we invent ways of sinning. These are what we called history. Look at our history. It's full of these things of humanity trying to fulfill themselves without God. It has never worked and it will never work because we were designed to run on God. The void in our heart is there by design. You will never fill that void without a personal loving relationship with God. When asked about the great commandment, the greatest duty, the greatest purpose, the single most important thing in our life, Jesus gave his answer in two parts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and, and, and your strength. And second is this, love your neighbors as yourself. God, Jesus gave this two parts, not because he didn't know what greatest meant. That greatest means one. Not two, but Jesus gave two parts because two are inseparable. You cannot separate it. If you truly love God, then you must also truly love people that he loves. If you do not love God, there really is no ultimate reason why you should love other people, except just because I want to. And that's not true love it's emotional it's feeling it's sinfulness self-based we talked about this can we call love that is totally self-based self-centered as love we could call a lot of things but especially agape love we cannot First John 4.20 says this, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. You cannot have one without the other. This brings us to our second necessity. Second necessity of, okay, we must love our neighbors. We have to love each other in an agape love. John 13, 34 says this, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you with the word agape for love. You also are to love one another. 1 John 3, 1 says this, Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Romans 5, 5 says this, now this hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Remember, heart to love and the power to love comes from God. You cannot have the true heart and the power, the ability to love without God. The problem that most of us have is that we try to love other people without involving God, without thinking about God, without loving God at the same time. We try to separate my love for God over here and my love for others over here. We compartmentize it. 
Love doesn't work that way. God said the greatest gift, and you combine the two. Because without the one, you cannot have the other. I don't care if it's your actual siblings, if your friends, if your girlfriend, boyfriend, your parents. If you try to truly love them without having God on your mind, you're going to fail. It could be some other worldly defined love, but it will not be biblical love. God designed it such a way. And what happens in this world, when we try to love other way, people without having God in our mind, without having God in the middle of that relationship, when we try to do good things of loving people while not truly having God on our mind, we are not joyful when we love them that way. We are not happy. We are tired. We feel obligated. We feel like a weight, a burden to love other people. Well, that's not how love works. Sometimes we feel resentful in the fact that we have to sacrifice ourselves and humble ourselves. Why should I do that? If you, if, if you have God in the middle of your loving relationship, then everything comes together. You're humble before God. So naturally, you're humble in your love. You are not self-demanding in that love. You are giving in that love. Let me close today. As we close, let me ask you guys one question. I want you to really think about this earnestly and honestly, okay? One question for all of you at home and every one of you here. Who is the one person that you love the most right now? Who is the one person that you love right now, Daniel? It better be me. No, no, just kidding. Every one of you, think about it. Who do you love the most right now? When I look back to when I was a teen, for me, it was me. I loved myself more than anything else at that time. It's not that I didn't know God. I knew God. I knew that God loved me. But at that time, I think my love for God was more, how do I put it, abstract, more ideal. Looking back, I know why I felt this way because I did not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I knew of him. But I really never actually had a relationship with him. And also my parents. I love my parents. But I took their love for granted. I see all the negativities. Why are they like that? But I rarely thought about the positivities. All of the good things that they do for me. All of the love they give me. I rarely thought about these. They could have done nine things that's good for me and did one thing I didn't like and that one thing would stick out. Because my parents' love for me was a given to me. Because I didn't truly appreciate their love for me. I never really thought about their love for me or my love for them. Because it was something that was just taken for granted. As a result, the person that I love the most in my life was me. That's not love. You will never be happy that way. You will never be fulfilled. You will always be feeling alone. You'll be lonely. You will not be fulfilled. You will run dry. Youth of Cornerstone, we are to first and foremost love God. I really encourage you to be steadfast in your QT. Don't take it as an obligation. It's an opportunity to, to be with God. Tell yourself. Remind yourself how much you love God. And take that time 
just spend time with God, to rest with God daily in your Sabbath. Ephesians 6.24 tells us, love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. With an undying love, love God. I really want to ask you today. You guys are young, but you guys are capable of love. That's how God created you. You can do it. You must do it. Otherwise, you will not be fulfilled. I don't care if you're 12 or 24. You will not be fulfilled without loving God. I pray that all of us will, ha will have the will to love God and others with an undying love. Not undying love to be lazy. Not undying love to just, just surf the web. Not an undying love to do something that's fun. But undying love for God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. We humble ourselves before you, Lord. We are not worthy of your love, but you will love us anyways, because that's who you are. You are love. You have never, ever not loved us. All those times we, we turned our backs on you, all of the times that we didn't want to spend with you, because you were a bother to us. You were some kind of an obligation. Even at those times, you still loved us, Lord. Oh, we are not kids anymore, Lord. We are youth. We are adults. We are young adults. We know what love is. We know whether we're loving or not, Lord. And we know that we want to be happy, that we want to be fulfilled. We don't want to be lonely. I don't want to be alone in my world of one. You designed us so that we cannot be fulfilled without you. You, you created us to run on you. And I pray that we would all realize that, Lord, that we will not be ignorant of that. We will not be foolish enough to disregard that wayside but to grab hold of that Lord and fulfill our design I pray that we would love you with an undying love that we would steadfastly spend time with you in your word and in prayer and spend time with our parents our siblings our friends loving them with an undying unconditional love Lord Give us the power because it says you give us the heart and the power, Lord, that you overflowed our hearts with your Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray that, that we would hold fast to you and get our power from you so we could love and be fulfilled, Lord. We thank you for keeping us safe. We thank you for all of the things that you provide house for the rest, food for nourishment, love for our survival, Lord. I pray that this next week we will be able to love you, love our parents, love our siblings and friends, love the world, people, everyone that we come across, Lord, that we would have an agape love in our hearts. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I do have one uh, announcement, uh, especially. Uh, we wanted to kind of do that uh, praise thing for Easter. I sent everybody a link. Uh, if you can, it doesn't matter if you sing off key, okay? You could totally sing off key. I could really put your volume really low because I could edit this thing too. <laughs> so I don't, we don't need you to be a professional singer. You could be totally off key. Please, what's important is we have your face, that we have your participation, that we come together as a youth. So please, please share in that, uh, in that experience with us. Okay? Thank you.
Let's go into our small groups and really participate together, okay? If you can, turn on your video, turn on your audio, and let's really discuss. All right, let's go.